All right, here we go. It is 11.35. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. We're really excited. We've got another great technical session. Uh, I'd like uh, you all to meet Raji Ishwaran. She's from Microsoft. She's got a great talk to walk us through. So let's dive in. Over to you, Raji. Hey, thank you. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for taking the time uh, to spend the next 20, 25 minutes with me and hope you hang around and uh, let's make this a more, uh, you know, uh, interactive session with questions at the end as well. Uh, a little bit about myself, uh, Raji Ishwaran. I'm a group program manager on Azure, uh, working specifically on Azure data lake storage. So my team, uh, we build the big data storage platform for Microsoft and also for customers like yourselves uh, to run big data analytics pipelines on. A little bit about myself. I joined Microsoft uh, around 11 years ago, started off in the Dynamics team and then quickly switched over to uh, the internal big data um, analytics platform, which was originally at the time uh, under the Bing organization. And I've been in that team doing you know, big data analytics stuff for the past decade. Um, and so super happy to share my experiences with you. So let's just get right in. Why is this session important to me? Why is it important to, uh, uh, to Microsoft? Um, and what can I share with you um, on my uh, team's experience as we built this? Like all organizations, uh, Microsoft is no different. We own and operate a lot of platforms, systems, applications that you know, either fuel our, uh, our company, whether it's the HR systems or the finance systems, or the products that we uh, run and offer, which is like Bing or Office or Windows. All of these applications, you know, they work on data. We get intelligence from that data and they power the intelligence and the decisions that we need to go and make. And so it's super important for us. How do we think about the, the, the data lake within Microsoft? Um, we don't think of this just as technology. We think of this as the collection of teams and products that use the platform. We think of this as the ecosystem of developers, administrators, and engineers that use the platform. We look at this as the collection of uh, workloads including the diversity of workloads, whether it's batch processing or streaming or interactive. Uh, a collection of all of this is what we really think about as the big data uh, platform for the company. And as you can see, we've come a long way. Like I said, we started off with Bing. Um, we opened up the ecosystem a few years after we started this platform to the company, and we've pretty much got every uh, team or uh, product within the company using the platform to run big data analytics. Um, so let's get let's dive in on what our journey looks like over the time that we built this uh, platform. Let's start with the guiding principles that we used. The first principle that we wanted to use was, uh, you know, simplicity in terms of the approach. We wanted to make this uh, a big data platform as a service. Um, and so we, the, the, uh, the analytics platform team, owned and operated the service on behalf of all of these teams. And we wanted to make this super simple and super approachable for all of the teams at Microsoft. The second guiding principle was scale. High performance at massive scale, but no trade-offs on cost. So we wanted to give this service to our teams at the lowest cost possible. And you know, scaling this platform to, when we started off, it was you know, a few petabytes, and now we are a multi-exabyte platform. And so that was a very core principle that we, we used as part of building the platform. And the third one, yeah, and this was initially maybe not a very, um, uh, core guiding principle, but we learned very quickly that data gravity and sharing of data assets within the data lake is going to be very, very important. And so we use that as one of our core tenets and principles to say, you know, even if you're not democratizing the data, make access to that data super simple. And we have teams within the platform that do democratize data uh, if, if there's, you know, no you know, you know, privacy aspects to it. Uh, but even for the other kinds of data, the principle was make it super simple for the different teams at Microsoft to get access to each other's data such that they can get the value out of that data. So that's how we started. Uh, let's start on what we, what we did well or what we think we did well. Number one was we made compute, big data compute, uh, computation running on thousands of machines over petabytes of data. We made that super approachable. And the way we did this was um, we, we didn't, put the burden of managing infrastructure or machines 
on the developers that were actually trying to solve the problem, right? We made it super approachable, whether it was in the form of, you know, how do I create the resources? What's the language that I use? I mean, I'll go into a little bit of detail on the language that we had built um, uh, and actually the compute platform, I wouldn't even call it language. Um, I'll, I'll go into a few details about why that made it so approachable. The second one was the simplicity, whether it was the operational excellence of, you know, ordering capacity or managing chargebacks to the different team, taking out the financials and the economics away from the teams that are using it. Um, so we built our own, uh, you know, capacity management team and cost attribution team. We built tools to kind of look at how hot the data is and how do people think about, okay, do I retain this data? Do I get rid of it? We made that super simple um, for the teams. And so as a combination of the approachability of the platform and the simplicity with which they can, you know, they can onboard to that platform, we saw huge uh, adoption on the, on the platform. And third, there is definitely this element of data culture because, you know, you can offer the platform at the end of the day, the quality of the data completely depends on the developers that are actually on, uh, you know, operating on that data and how, how easy it is for them to bring the data in um, you know, and and write the the scripts that can uh, you know can compute against that data. And so what we did was we had a vibrant community of developers that were using it. You know, these developers would write scripts that can be used throughout the company because the data itself can be shared so easily. We had performance boot camps where not just uh, you know our team, other teams within the company would actually come and share best practices. Uh, you know, and so the the the, the community was also very very uh, vibrant. And you you see this pattern. Uh, you know, quite uh, well adopted even in, in the industry today with the open source culture that's out there. But this is what we did well. Um, so let's talk about the, 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 the computation environment that we built. So this was our secret weapon, our magic sauce, if you will. We called it SCOPE, and it stands for, as you can see on the screen, it's stood for structured computations optimized for parallel execution. For people who've been in the big data space, this is the equivalent of MapReduce. Um, so this was a it was a language, it was a runtime and a parallel query execution framework that made it possible for people to run these big data jobs on the platform, very similar to the Spark engines of the world and the, and the MapReduce engines of the world today. And this is what we had started, you know, more than a decade ago. It was inspired by SQL. And so it made it super easy for, you know, people to onboard because they had to just write SQL-like queries, similar to like a select statement. Uh, we had extract statement to extract the data from the files that were stored on the platform. There were select statements that would uh, select data from that, uh, uh, you know, from the extraction that was just done. Output statements, just, just write it. This, the third thing we did also with Scope was a lot of .NET integration. You know, we're Microsoft and we had a lot of developers that were very familiar with .NET. Um, and I'll touch on this, the, the last element of this as well, which is extensibility. And, you know, the combination of the framework that allowed developers to use .NET and extend the language. So people could write their own, um, you know, functions and kind of complement the language and the capabilities that Scope already provided. So this was is essentially what led to, you know, really broad ado adoption within the company. And now, you know, as, as we've kind of progressed over time, you know, we've, we've seen similar things like Spark and, and all of the other engines, and we've tried to adopt some of that in, in, in our um, uh, uh, platform as well over time. And I'll walk you through, you know, what prompted us to go do that. What are the challenges we faced? The first challenge is, like I said, one of our core uh, principles was to make sure that we had uh, scale as one of our, you know, our, our primary goals. And like I said, we started off with petabytes and we were growing so rapidly we needed to make sure that we were able to keep up with the demands of the offices of the world and the windows of the world. And so, you know, we were, we were growing in hundreds of petabytes to exabytes. And um, if you attended the keynote uh, address earlier this morning, uh, one of the things that people did at that time was, you know, build large clusters. And at the time, you know, even a thousand node cluster was a huge thing. We actually were able to scale our clusters to you know, tens of thousands uh, of nodes where our clusters are up in the 50,000 node range. And the reason we did that is because of the other principle, you know, sharing data. So we wanted to make sure that it was a huge multi-tenant system where different teams could access e each other's data without increasing their costs. Um, and we had to go and deal with that challenge of scaling to those exabytes. Another challenge that we ran into was because we were growing so fast, and because you know we had to go and buy all of that hardware, we ran into data center limitations. The, there wasn't enough space in the data centers that uh, you know we we originally planned on going into. And again, with all of the growth, we you know 
back to the the principle we had to offer this at low cost to our customers how do we keep you know the the, the efficiencies going and keeping that low cost so how do we do this number one and this is a pattern that you've seen even in in, in dremio for example you have to understand the workloads and what they're trying to do and so we started looking at the workloads that were running on the platform what were they trying to do was there repetition were there temporary or intermediate data sets that were being created such that if there were 10 jobs and the first job was you know creating an intermediate data set could we cache that or store that such that the remaining nine jobs or 20 jobs that wanted that intermediate data set didn't have to start again from that raw data right so we had to understand all of these workloads and then we built these capabilities into the platform such that we could optimize um, and, and you give the again for, for performance and also for scale right so we, we did that the other one was you know we started looking at what it would mean to be a hyperscale platform so things that we did number one was you know uh, scale out. You, you've seen that concept in some of these, um, uh, you know, HD Insight or Databricks type uh, uh, clusters. Um, what we did differently there was because we were owning and operating our own hardware, there were two elements that we had to keep in mind. There was the, the servers themselves and do we want to stick with the co-located compute and storage, which was the trend back then. And then how do we think of the, the hardware SKUs? Because you could pick SKUs based on high memory or high compute or high storage. And at the time, everything was co-located. And so we kind of evolved our SKUs. Uh, and that was the third uh, element of how we did this. We evolved our SKUs and we built heterogeneous clusters. And so the same cluster could host, you know, uh, uh, servers from five years back where it was more optimized for compute. And then if we saw that the storage uh, demand was going up, we could, in the same cluster, we could add more storage intensive, uh, intensive SKUs, but we could still co-locate the compute and uh, the storage to get that fast performance. What we also did, we worked with the data center team to give us the network infrastructure such that we could go into the core, you know, the distributed or disaggregated compute and storage, right? And so we had to invest on that over time. And the other thing is to avoid the data center space limitations, we really had to go and invest in, okay, where do we really want to be? Which regions do we want to be in? And then we had to go and create plans to be in those regions you know, work with the data center planning crew uh, to, make, to make sure we had the power in the data center space to, to accomplish that. So those were the three uh, top level things. There's a whole bunch of other technical challenges, but uh, probably not too unique uh, to us. It's probably the, the same challenges that any big data uh, platform or data lake uh, implementation crew would face. But these were probably the three that stood out in terms of, you know, what do we do outside of the, the, the core technology? What did we learn from our customers? Like I said, scope was a proprietary language. The formats that we used, uh, we call them structured streams, very similar to what you've heard uh, today, Parquet or Delta Lake or um, Iceberg. We had our own proprietary uh, format called, we call them structured streams. Um, and we had the intelligence, but again, uh, nobody could use that outside of our platform. And so that was the one feedback, the top feedback that we got from our internal teams saying, give us open source not just for the formats but also for the other analytics engines that are out there and you know we started getting uh, developers who knew spark or who knew hive and hbase and they couldn't use those technologies against the data that we had on the platform so that was the first feedback that we got another huge learning for us was you know you know two three years ago when gdpr hit us um, governance was uh, important to everybody and for a, for a team that was operating uh, such a huge analytics platform um, we had to support that on behalf of our customers. And so we had to go and create, uh, you know, on the platform, we had to go and create um, capabilities to do data lineage um, and, you know, create that catalog of what the data sets were, what that data lineage were, you know, was, and, you know, how was uh, data transforming over time and also to even manage the DSR requests. And so we had to go and create capabilities such that if our teams had DSR requests, they could actually satisfy that on our platform. And so that was a multi-year journey and it was a huge undertaking for our team. Um, and what we learned out of that is problems like this isn't solved without just, you know, within just the, the platform team, but everyone, the whole community had to come together. And that's what made our journey successful, right? It was us building the technology, but in collaboration and cooperation with the rest of the uh, rest of the company. And the last one was similar to the same feedback that we got around open source. 
people couldn't use Azure because we were a proprietary platform uh, within Microsoft. And yes, we had the exabytes of data, but they couldn't use some of the other Azure services. They couldn't use uh, partner technologies. Again, Toma mentioned this earlier today. There is, you know, vendor lock out. That was the classic symptom that we experienced at the time. People couldn't use partner solutions um, and they were asking, uh, you know, for Azure integration. This is just a very quick picture of where we've come over time. Like I said, we started off in 2008 with a few petabytes. Um, over the first few years, it was us working with Bing and you know, kind of helping them with things like you know, building recommendation engines or experimentation platforms or understanding their user query patterns. We then expanded that to include the Office team, you know, uh, you know, building the big data platform for Office such that we can help them with their telemetries. How's the Office business doing? Um, you know, how do they do spam detection? You know, things, you know, scenarios like that. We then opened this up to the Windows team. And so that's what essentially drew the hockey stick growth. And a lot of this was the teams within Microsoft trying to understand the value of each other's data sets. And it was just, you know, uh, it, 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 that was essentially another reason why uh, we, we grew so rapidly. And what you see at the tail end is essentially a result of what happened with, uh, with the GDPR. And so a lot of the teams, what they wound up doing was they had to really go back and look at the data they were storing in the system and understand what they were storing it for. And there was a lot of cleanup, especially with the 30 day restriction policy. A lot of teams wound up saying, you know what? Um, I, I don't think I need all of the raw data. Let me keep the curated data, which doesn't have the PII. Um, and they, they started you know, curating the data to what needs to be kept. And then they started getting a, a rid of some of the raw data. And some of the other teams did the opposite. They said, look, I need the raw data. I'm gonna keep them very, very secured. Um, and I will you know, deal with all of the PII elements as needed. And so different teams took different approaches, but there was a lot of cleanup uh, as a result of GDPR. So where are we headed now? This is our vision <clears throat> and our mission. What we want to do, whether it's outside customers or whether it's the teams that we support within the company, our goal is every organization needs to extract the maximum value for their data sets. We don't want them to just come and store their data. We want them to get the max maximum value. How do you do that? And the way we're doing that is, essentially our current strategy, which is we've built Azure Data Lake storage. This is the central platform, a storage platform for building your, your data lakes. Everyone brings their data, diverse uh, data sources, diverse formats, bring them into the data lake, and then you get the rest of the Azure ecosystem. And you can pick based on your use cases, you pick which analytics or compute services you need. And so we built that integration with all of the other uh, compute services we have within the company. And we also took that outside and we said, look, we also want to make third party solutions available to these customers. And so this is the vision that we are on and we are slowly taking the internal big data analytics platform and we're moving these customers over to the Azure world. And we've already started that journey. We've started moving exabytes of data already to Azure Data Lake Storage, which is the external facing service that all of our third party customers use. And so over time, we don't want to have these silos. We talk about data silos all the time. Within Microsoft, we unfortunately have a huge data silo where a lot of our, you know, our intelligent data is stuck on a silo, which is, uh, you know, which was historically more proprietary. We've made strides to make it uh, accessible to the rest of Azure, but we're taking it all the way and bringing that into our central data lake storage platform, uh, which is you know uh, what all of our customers use as well. So that's that's where we are going. Um, and what I'd like to leave you with today is think about what is your data lake strategy. I when I talk to a lot of customers, they're very focused on the technology. The technology in, is, is very important. You're hearing about that from all of the other speakers today. You know, how do you think about Hive? How do you think about data formats? How do you think about Arrow and you know, optimizing the access to the data? Like all of that is super important. But there is also another element. If you want to make your data lake successful, you need to make sure that the people who need the insights have accessibility and there is no friction um, for them to onboard your platform. Make sure you're giving them the elements to manage their costs. And one of the reasons why it was so important for us to move to the Azure uh, um, services was there were so many capabilities that we've built over time, such as you know, redundancy options and tiering and things like snapshots. So you have to give them all of those capabilities. And so evolution of your platform is also super important. And again, the community, are you leveraging your community? 
within your company, you'll be surprised that there are pockets of expertise and experience within your company that you might not be even taking advantage of unless you open that community out uh, and, and, and you know, allow your developers and your experts to come and teach the rest of your company on how, how best to build your data lake. So with that, um, that's our experience. I would love to take the questions. Thank you all for taking time uh, to come talk to us and let's open this up for questions. Fantastic. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, great. Okay. Yes, I can. So, um, I'm going to, uh, now start, uh, bringing people in one at a time. So I, so far I have one person in the queue, Adam, I'm going to click to bring you in in just a sec. If anyone else wants to ask a, a live question, click that button in the upper right to add your audio video. And then just make sure, of course, you've got your, um, you give access to hop in, uh, to your camera and to your microphone, and then I'll see you here. Uh, so I'm going to give, uh, give a try, Adam, let's see if this works. Clicking to bring you in. It may not. We've had some, you know, um, some trouble with this working before. So maybe while we're trying, I see Scott coming up next. Uh, Raji, there's some other questions that came in on the announcements. If you scroll up a little bit, you'll start to see, I think, uh, um, maybe you want to hit okay. one of those while we try to bring someone in. I can read one off for you if you want to. Okay. Let's so, uh, sorry, Adam, that didn't that didn't work. I'm going to try Scott too in the background here. Let me see. There's one question in here, and I'm not entirely sure. Uh, Jam, I would love to take this uh, offline with you, and we can discuss this on Slack. We actually store. We have, in at least in our platform, both on the internal platform side and also on the Azure Data Lake storage side, we do have petabytes of uh, data, even in single files. We can do terabits per second uh, of throughput on the platform. Um, and so billions of rows per second is really not uh, new to us because of the distributed nature of the platform. It's going to depend on um, you know, how many uh, you know, compute nodes or VMs you have on the compute cluster as well as the, you know, how you have distributed your storage. But that's absolutely possible today. We run really, really large workloads uh, within the platform. Now, 1 billion rows per second, I personally haven't tried that, but um, uh, I, can, I can check with my colleagues if anyone's actually tried that, but it doesn't seem too far-fetched. Great, okay. And we do have Scott. So, Scott, if you want to go ahead with your question. Hi, how are you? Hopefully we have a little bit of time for this. Um, could you expand a little bit on what you meant by now supporting GDPR more with the platform? So let, let, me, let me give you the example of um, where we started, right? So at the time, if you look at any analytics engine, uh, the, the way the, the data comes into the platform is an append-only system, right? And so you start off with a stream and we keep, you keep appending it. And so, for example, if you wanted to go and support GDPR, we needed the ability for someone to take this humongous stream with bits and pieces of data inside that, that stream or file that needs to be uh, removed. And so we needed to provide the ability for someone or for our customers in an append only platform to be able to do deletes, you know, because you, you typically can't update right. in between, right? And so that was the capability that we built. And so uh, we, we created the capability of, you know, allowing updates on an append only system. That's essentially what we had to go and build. And so there were multiple things that we had to go and do. Number one, on the storage layer or on the compute layer, being able to give people the ability to say, hey, that's a delete, please delete these records. And then another capability that says compact these streams, such that you know, if there was a delete, then when, the day, you know, when Scope, for example, was trying to read that stream, we knew that that element was deleted and we would not return it back to the user. Then we would have a compaction process to say, we know there's a whole bunch of deletes that have already happened. Let's go compact it. So things like that is what we had to go and build. And these had to be built as, as platform capabilities, right? And so that's what we did in an append-only system. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Scott. You're welcome. Uh, I don't see any other live Q&A questions coming in at the bottom. So, uh, Raji, if you want to go just pick another one out of the chat. and uh, Yeah, let me go look. We've got, uh, got some time. Uh, so let's see, uh, there's one from Supun. Do you use open source technologies to process data? Like I said, when we originally started, it was a proprietary platform. Uh, we used things like structured streams, which is, which was a proprietary format. We used scope, which was proprietary over time. What we've done is even in that platform, we allowed, uh, some of the open source technologies uh, and languages to operate. 
Now what we're doing is because we have that data silo problem, we're saying we don't want different platforms. We're actually putting all of this data on Azure Data Lake storage and Azure Data Lake storage supports all of the open source, uh, you know, technologies. Spark, you know, Databricks is integrated very well with uh, um, uh, with Azure Data Lake Storage. HD Insights is. Uh, take Dremio. We are actually we're working very closely with Dremio. You can bring any open size, uh, open source platform, and just use the driver because we are an HDFS um, uh, protocol on top of the Data Lake Storage uh, service, right? So that's that's where we are going right now. And so yes, we do support all of the open source uh, technologies to process the data. Um, another one. Give me one second. Where's my? Yeah, and there's a few more too. If you if you scroll up as well, that came in kind of yeah. above my rem, uh, reminders for a live Q and A. Yeah, Jerry, the name of the platform we call it um, internally, and the re there was a reason why I didn't really go into the details of this. We call it Cosmos, and it's it could get a little confusing because of the uh, overlap with Cosmos TV, but we actually call it internally Cosmos. Uh, let me see. Yep. Uh, architecture diagram. I don't have a great architecture diagram right now, but think of this very similar to uh, Hadoop, where you have a front end layer, you have uh, your compute layer, and you've got uh, similar to HDFS, you've also got the storage layer. They're all co located on the same machine. And we also have metadata um, um, uh, elements to this as well. There is um, a a, a paper um, that you can probably look uh, online uh, on Azure storage, very similar architecture to that, but that's essentially what the architecture would look like. Very similar to Hadoop. There's another question. How will you guys be consuming the data from ADLS Gen 2? Um, ADLS Gen 2 is going to be the, the storage platform, which is going to house all of these exabytes of data. And we consume that data through Synapse Analytics, for example. If someone wants to go and upload this into their data warehouse, we can do that. If someone wants to just run, you know, Spark queries against that data, we can do that. You can hook up a HD Insight cluster to it. Um, you can hook up Databricks clusters to it. If you want to use Dremio or any of the other uh, Presto or any of that, essentially the, the, the source is the driver. It's an HDFS driver. You use the driver and you connect to the data in the data lake and that's how you use it. Uh, let me see. don't fully understand this. Any possibility and study was done in Amazon for GPU CUDA data processing. I'm not aware of this. So uh, since I don't understand the question, I'm going to go to the next one. And I'm, I'm not aware of any, uh, you know, GPU data processing um, study yet. Uh, but if we do one, we'll be happy to publish that. Are you building any enterprise data model or data warehousing capabilities on ADLS Gen 2? Um, ADLS Gen 2 is the storage part of the data lake. Um, and you have things like Synapse Analytics that actually have the data warehousing capabilities. And if you've listened to, again, some of the sessions before, the trend now is, um, and it's, it's, it's amazing how we've been able to keep up with, you know, the platform with, uh, you know, co-located compute and storage for this long. But we're actually moving away from that to the, the co you know, the distributed or disaggregated compute and storage. There are definitely, you know, trade-offs and, and uh, benefits as well. One of the challenges we had with the co-located model is we're always playing catch up with SKUs because, you know, you, there is a very fine balance between what's our compute demand and storage demand. And if you don't get that right, you wind up, you know, spend uh, stranding a lot of capacity. And that's, you know, it's, it's always a race. You, now you split that up. You can scale these two independently of each other, right? And in order for you to go do that, your service has to be super smart about, okay, which domain, which network domain is your data in? Which network domain do you want to put your compute resources in? And so that's the investment that we're trying to do. And so, uh, so, so going back, we do have these data warehouse capabilities. They will be in the disaggregated model because you've got the storage at the bottom. You've got Synapse Analytics where your data warehouse can reside. You've got, you know, Spark that's also accessing the data here. You could run HD Insight, which is again, another compute uh, engine. Uh, accessing your uh, data remotely because it's remote storage. So that architecture is very much a pattern today and a lot of customers are using it. Uh, and so ADLS Gen 2 itself doesn't uh, offer the warehousing capabilities because it's part of the compute infrastructure that's yeah. on top. Great, great answer, Raji. And by the way, I want to jump in because we're okay. basically out of time. Um, 
yeah, that, no that, problem. That open data lake architecture, that's really the whole the whole point of this, right? Bring those different compute engines to do all sorts of different things, things we can do today, things we don't even know about in the future, right? Uh -huh. um, so with that, okay. uh, we're, we're going to close down, but keep the questions and, you know, and the comments and the discussion going over in Slack. So I invite everybody, including Raji, right? Go ahead over to Slack and you can keep posting right. your questions there, okay. not, not just here at the event, but afterwards as well. Thanks, everyone. And thank you, Raji.